morning of D-Day in my brigade. I was a brigadier by this time, and I had five commanders serving with me. And we had to break through to the Orne Canal and the Orne Bridge over the River Orne, and that had been seized the night before by by a 6th Airborne Division, parachuted in, and gliders came too, and glided and parachuted into that area. They had to seize, seize the bridges intact. And they did, in fact, capture them. The canal bridge was the most important one. And that was where I joined up with them two hours after landing, which is about six miles inland. But first we had to fight our way through the coastal defenses, which was called the Atlantic Wall, which wasn't as bad as all that, and then get up to the bridge. So I did have to cross the bridge, and I did have a pipe with me. <laughs> <laughs> When at Normandy landings drew near, it was recognised that the commando forces would need to operate under a single command, and so Lord Lovett was promoted to brigadier and given charge of the 1st Special Service Brigade. The name Special Service was changed to commando only in December 1944. The objective from Salt Beach on D-Day was to link up with the 6th Airborne at the bridges spanning the River Orne and the Khan Canal, which could be used for a possible enemy counter-attack and the commanders went fully laden with ropes and inflatable dinghies. The plan was that the 1st Special Service Brigade, made up of No. 3, No. 4, as well as No. 6 Army Commando and No. 45 Royal Marine Commando, would land on the extreme flank of the Allied forces to cut inland and join the two brigades already dropped by glider and parachute at the bridges. These airborne forces were only lightly armed, and could not be expected to sustain a concerted counter-attack. Force S, with the 1st Special Service Brigade, left from Southampton on the Princess Astrid and the Maid of Orneon, whilst No. 4 Commando embarked from HMS Tormenta at Warsash on the River Hamble. No. 4 Commando was augmented by French commandos of No. 1 Troop on LCI 527 and No. 8 Troop on LCI 528, commanded by... Captain Philip Kiefer. These 177 troops were the only Frenchmen to land on the beaches on D-Day, and to emphasise their role in the operation, it was agreed that they should be allowed to lead the flotilla. Number 4 Commando were a part of the second wave tasked with destroying the casino stronghold in the coastal battery at Oosterham. However, when they landed, they found the infantry pinned down by enemy fire but immediately entered the fight and went about clearing the beach defences with tremendous speed and aggression. They pushed forward, breaking out onto the coastal road before the French troops set off for the casino strong point, whilst the British commandos were to deal with a gun battery at Oostrom. After bitter fighting at the casino, a British Centaur tank arrived and proceeded to destroy the German gun emplacement, and after severe fighting, the position was taken with heavy casualties on both sides. The rest of Number 4 Commando was moving along the Lyon-sur-Mer road towards their objective, the gun battery. The attack was almost unopposed, as they discovered the guns were only wooden dummies made from telegraph poles. The real guns were removed three days previously in position further inland, and the commanders withdrew from Oosterham to join other units in their brigade moving inland. Meanwhile, the advanced brigade headquarters contacted the 6th Airborne Division to learn that the two bridges were captured intact. Following on half an hour behind No. 4 Commando came the remainder of the brigade, with No. 6 Commando at their head, followed by the Royal Marine of No. 45, and then the brigade headquarters with No. 3 Commando. As the fighting in Oosterham was going on, the brigade formed up on Sword Beach to the tune of Blue Bonnets. It is claimed Lord Lovett carried a Winchester rifle, However, his memoirs state he was armed with a short-barreled U.S. Army carbine. What is not disputed is that Lord Lovett instructed his personal piper, Bill Millen, to pipe the commandos ashore. When the regulations were cited to Lord Lovett, he replied, Ah, but that's the English War Office, and that doesn't apply to us because we are from Scotland. By this time, most resistance on the beaches was cleared, and enemy action consisted of a distant bombardment. However, this barrage and the unexpected earlier fighting to get off the beach had cost the commandos 60 casualties. With No. 6 Commander blazing a trail, the brigade were quickly off the mark and pushing inland. 
Lovett planned on a very cut and thrust procession to the bridges, proceeding mostly cross country to avoid delay along the major routes where German resistance would be dug in and waiting. It took three and a half hours to advance the six and a half miles to the bridges, with the lead elements mounted on bicycles linking up with the glider-borne troops from D Company, 2nd Battalion, Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry, under Major John Howard, who had captured the bridges spanning the River Orne and the Cannes Canal. At 13.30 the men at the bridges heard the sound of bagpipes. As the commandos arrived they crossed the bridges and joined the rest of the 6th Airborne Division to defend the eastern perimeter. Despite rushing across in small groups, 12 men were killed by sniper fire, mostly shot in the head, and men crossing the bridges wore helmets rather than barrows from then on. Lord Lovett's commanders arrived at a little past 1pm at Pegasus Bridge, though the rendezvous time, as per the plan, was noon, not a few minutes later as generally believed. The 1st Special Service Brigade finally returned to England on the 9th of September 1944, landing at Southampton and Gosport.